it is so nice to see all of you. Um, I, like you, am still experiencing all the emotions of this recent week or two or three. I can't keep track, subhanAllah. And it's just an honor to be back at MCC. This is actually my childhood masjid, so I'm seeing some familiar faces here. It's so lovely to see all of you, all the old and new faces. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So as Dr. Rania mentioned, I am a psychologist. I work with Maristan. I also work with Children's Health Council. So I do work with children, teens, and young adults, as well as their parents. So I am pretty familiar with having difficult conversations when it comes to stress, trauma, dealing with difficult life transitions, and thinking about what's going on. Really, the only words I have are, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Verily, to Allah we belong, and to Him is our return. I wanted to start with that because in the face of tragedies, we often don't know what to do, what to say, and this expression from our faith, from our iman, it's that expression of we're just going to trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to say that truly it is to Him that we belong and to Him is our return. And it's okay, as Dr. Rania mentioned, to acknowledge all of our emotions first and to take care of our emotions before we get in the caretaker role of our family, as we say, when we, or as we hear when we get on the airplane, put on your own oxygen mask before you put someone else's on. Um, and I know today Sister Wajma is also going to get into self-care and strategies, but I just also wanted to emphasize that so you're hearing that from all three of us. So... I speak to you today as a sister in faith, fellow human being, and as a family member who is grieving these terrible tragedies right now. And I say tragedies because there are multiple complex tragedies happening all at once, and I think that's what also adds to the pain and suffering across communities, and what also makes the response with our children, with ourselves, with our coworkers, with our schools really nuanced. And sometimes it may be very difficult to know what to say when someone else is also hurting and suffering at the same time. So whether we're talking about Palestine and Gaza directly, whether we're talking about people killed in Israel, we're talking about human rights, we're talking about people's dignity to live, right? Um, especially the children. We're talking about children, right? You know, we've talked about these topics a lot in our community, unfortunately, and a lot of us may be feeling that deja vu right now for those who have gone through those years after 9-11 or who have, as Dr. Rania was saying, seen and heard about other tragedies affecting our community. So I guess I just want to start with that. There are so many different layers of grief right now across communities, and we're familiar with a lot of those things, so it's important to start there when we talk about identity. Um, right now, as Muslims, we are seeing our brothers and sisters in Palestine going through the most atrocious of tragedies. I mean, no words. I mean, genocide, plain and clear. So that, it hurts our Muslim faith, our identity there. It hurts our humanity as human beings. For those of us here who are Arab or from Arab backgrounds or who are from Palestine, from Palestine, there's that extra layer of like shared, you know, community. Um, and as we know for Muslims, whether or not we're from Palestine, Al-Quds, it holds a very special place in our hearts. So there's that multiple layers of connection of identity here. And it's okay to feel all the emotions that come with belonging to those multiple identities. There could be fear, sadness, anger, rage, confusion, all of those emotions, mm -hmm. just not even knowing how we feel. And that's also okay. But just to validate that all of those identities that we belong to, they are coming up not only as we grieve, but also in our day-to-day -day spaces. When we go to school, when we go to work, if we take public transportation, um, even as you drive drive down the street, you know, you're like sometimes maybe aware of how you look if you're a visible Muslim. I see, you know, many of you, mashallah, wearing hijab right now. Some of you may also wear hijab outside. So there's that visible aspect too. So just starting with that, I, I want to say that in the current climate, it's important to think about those identities, but also think about this word called backlash. When someone who looks like us is 
told like they committed a crime, right? We, we know what happens in our society. Like the whole group gets the blame, unfortunately. We've seen it across communities. We've seen it in the Muslim community. And subhanAllah, as we also discussed Monday with that circle, with Dr. Rania and everyone, we are all grieving. Many of you may have heard about what happened um, with uh, Wadiya al-Fayyumi. May Allah rest his soul in peace. I think that for many of us was our worst fear. I mean, we're thinking about how is our community going to experience? Um, how is our community going to be affected by what's happening far away, but then coming over here? So I just want to name those things. I know they're obvious, but I also think it's important to name where some of those emotions may be coming from with our identities, with someone then who is from our community who um, was targeted. Um, and may Allah rest his soul in peace. I mean, so... Again, I want to acknowledge it's heavy. It's a collective trauma. We all are affected in some way by trauma. We all have different experiences, of course, when we experience a stressor or know somebody who experiences that. It may not be touching us all in the same way, but it somehow does affect us. We may know family in Gaza, or we may have a friend who has family there, or simply watching the news and just remembering our brothers and sisters. The thing. I've heard from a lot of teachers this week, a lot of therapists and just humans is that sometimes you wonder why, why are these emotions in me? Like, why am I feeling all this? And, I, and or how, and how do I cope with it? Just as a reminder, if you feel these emotions, it means you are alive. Your heart is alive. Your heart is a vessel from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it's hurting, it means you care. You're seeing the humanity of your brothers and sisters. So it's about how do we use our heart that is hurting right now? And how do we talk to our children and our families when we are hurting and they might be hurting as well? And of course, not to assume, as Dr. Rania mentioned, because they may have different um, levels of knowledge about what's happening. So some of the tools that I want to share with you today, they've been taken from National Child Traumatic Stress Network, and there are also a lot of great resources online for parents. So I encourage all of you to look at that website and also many other websites out there for parents that just have a lot of great coping tools, like dealing with tragedy. This article Dr. Rania shared is actually almost like half of my outline was actually exactly your article. So I guess I should have just referenced your article. <laughs> So how can parents support their kids, especially at this time? First, as Dr. Rania said, acknowledging your own emotions. Acknowledge them and get that support. I think all of you coming here right now, it's a great just show of community. And also, you're holding space for yourself by allowing yourself to be taken care of by somebody. I think in many of our roles as mothers, family members, if you're teachers, even therapists in here, you're taking care of somebody else. It's a lot of work. It's actually just laboring a lot of times, right? So just allow yourself to be taken care of by other people, whether it is a friend, a family member, a spouse, a therapist, allow yourself to be taken care of this week and regularly, inshallah. So all of you coming here, I, I see that as you are allowing yourself to get that support, inshallah, from sisterhood. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is when we are flooded or overwhelmed, we're seeing a lot of things in the, the media, right? We may not be in a place where we can respond in a wise way, okay? I've seen a lot of this this week where we are in emotion mind, something where, you know, we're responding through emotion. So if your child comes and talks to you or if something is happening, just monitor where am I at right now? Am I in a sort of calm state of mind right now? Or am I, have I just read a really disturbing article, seen some really horrific things happening, right? Just kind of assess the state of your mind. And I see some young people in here, mashallahs, and, and I'm guessing the very young people may not have kids yet. So let's say if someone comes to talk to you about what's happening in Gaza or in the world, and you're all riled up, do you think it's going to be effective to relay your message right now? I see a nod or a head shake, right? Exactly. So whoever you're giving the message to or talking to, first just notice your own state of being right now. 
And if you're not in a place where you can engage, there's a really helpful framework that I did see on National Child Traumatic Stress Network, and it's called Pause, Rest, and Nourish. And it's a helpful framework that first just says, hey, if you're overwhelmed right now, take a pause. I actually want all of us right now to take a pause, including me, and just notice your emotions at this moment. Do a quick scan of your body and notice where is this emotion right now in your body? Sometimes we have mixed emotions and that's also okay, especially in a very, very conflicting and extremely difficult time like this. The next thing once we notice our emotional state is to reset our emotional state. And there could be a small thing we could do, such as vicar, which we were doing, doing some deep breaths, um, just taking a quick walk or like getting out for fresh air for a minute if you're in a, an office or you're in your house throughout the day, okay? Um, or if you've been scrolling and scrolling on your newsfeed, right, you, you can tell yourself, you know, I'm gonna get up right now off my phone and go drink some water and you know, I'll come back to my desk later but it's just taking that quick reset. The next is nourishing, and that's basically filling your cup. And this is something not only for all of us, but also for our children and our families, is to create routines in our daily life where we can actually reset all of our emotional energy. So that could mean at the end of the day, having a family dinner together. Um, it could be having a Quran time or circles. Um, it could even be something simple, like the drive in to school, checking in, maybe you, you sing a favorite song together, or you recite some favorite du'as together, or just have a little ritual that you do. Um, for me personally, this last week, I realized I was not exercising as much as I like to, and that was taking a toll on my body. And I finally, alhamdulillah, got out to my gym class, and you know, there was some of the like, you know, thank you. We all need that positive reinforcement, right? But I think a part of it was also finding some safety again and going out in public spaces. And I said, I, I have to go. I mean, I, I need to go to my gym class. And so I did, and, and that was me helping myself find routine again. You know, with kids, with, with trauma exposure, getting back into routines is really, really crucial. So as Dr. Rania already beautifully said, it's about when you're talking to kids, asking them what they already know. And, you know, I wanna also link this to the school setting when your kids are going to school, and I think I'm gonna focus more on the older than six, because as we said, with younger than six, we're gonna really limit the exposure that they have unless they bring it up or unless we're noticing some um, kind of clinical symptoms or regression. So with the older kids, simply ask them, what do you know already if they bring it up? And then deeply listen rather than trying to fix it, rather than trying to problem solve. Um, and then ask them, what questions do you have? Because if you just fill in all of the blanks, they may just think, hey, you gave me way more information than I even needed or asked for, right? Or, or that may be happening. Um, so just asking them, what would you like to know? And one perspective I think that's really important as a Muslim, but also just as a human being in this really confusing time, stay humble because you may not know everything. We, we don't know everything. We know there's so much misinformation out there with propaganda, different news sources, kind of telling your child and your teen, in this world, there's a lot of different opinions. How can we work together to find answers? Let's you know do some research together. And that can be a way that they also can, you know, as if they're a teen, for example, help support you and the family to share their research skills a little bit if they if they like that. Budding journalists maybe. Um, no, but actually it's just keeping the conversation open. It's more about the process than actually what answer you give them. Some of you may be asking, give me like the best thing I can do. And unfortunately we don't have the one perfect answer for you today. It's more of the process and it's your relationship with your child. It's really about creating that secure attachment Maintaining that attachment that, hey, you're safe to ask anything. I'm here to listen. I may not know all the answers, but that's okay. We're, we're in it together. So you're modeling as a family that you're there to keep your child safe and that adults in their life are supposed to keep them safe, inshallah. We, we really want to exude that message and model that to our kids. 
So Dr. Rania also talked about warning signs with younger kids, um, with elementary school kids. I'm going to mention also just excessive fear, worry, and sadness. They may be bringing up that kids are commenting about, you know, Israel and Palestine or bringing up certain news in their classroom and just even asking them, how did that make you feel? Or like, oh, okay, what was that discussion like? And just notice if you're seeing some strong emotional reactions from your child and see, do you want to talk about that more with me? They may just be noticing it, but not having an emotional reaction. So we also don't want to put it on them like, oh, why did your teacher say that? Or why did that kid say that? To see what they kind of bring up first, inshallah. Um, also want to be mindful of time. How much time do I have left? Okay. Um, also, when hearing about what's going on, there's a lot of misinformation and one-sidedness right now, right? I think that's where a lot of Muslims and Palestine supporters, of course, like, are feeling like, why is the Palestinian voice silenced? And your kids may be feeling that too in their schools. So that's where I think reminding them there are so many opinions out there and a lot of times the media is distorted. And you know we're gonna kind of work together on sharing resources with your teacher or finding comfortable ways to share that with their classroom. I want to say that very carefully, though, because as we know, there is hate out there and you want to be very careful in the environment your child is in. So I think if we were sitting in a different state than California, maybe there are other things we need to consider in our social and political context. Like, alhamdulillah, we're here in California in the Bay Area. And still we know there there is racism out there. There is Islamophobia out there even here. But I guess I just want to say I can't give one answer, but you knowing about your child's classroom, the classroom culture, the school culture, having contacts at the school, such as a personal connection with the school counselor, principal, you know, administration, I think that is a big strength in this time so that you know who to reach out to if needed. So kind of on that note, safety planning is something we do a lot as therapists. And I also like to think of in these times, what is a plan of safety if your child is going into school and there's a climate like this. I think A, just knowing who the safe adults are to talk to at their school. So it could be a teacher. It could be not even the principal, but like their Spanish teacher or something because they just have a good relationship with them. And having that one-on-one -on -one conversation that like, hey, just so you know, my kid is struggling a bit right now. Here's what we need right now to support them. And if you are a teen in this group, it's amazing to see you. And I hope you can also reach out and just find some safe person to talk to at your school um, or outside of school, inshallah. Um, I would also say with school culture, a lot of people, a lot of moms have been reaching out with statements or, you know, that this response is one-sided. Keep up that work as long as you feel you can do it and don't feel like you have the burden to keep doing that. There are, are also other parents, right? So stay connected with other parents who share those views and who you can get community with. Um, finally, you know, California law is very clear about anti-bullying and about, you know, this no discrimination policy. And so if you ever feel that that is happening, bullying, harassment, discrimination, please reach out to CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations. A lot of you may have heard of them. They're very accessible. I mean, you give them a call and you just report, hey, something happened. I don't know what that was, but I'm not comfortable. They can guide you in terms of what should you do? What are your rights? Um, what are the options that you have to get help? And sometimes even connecting with them and them reaching out to the person who did that, like that just sets a very clear boundary that this is not okay. Um, there are a lot more other things, but I would just say Channeling all of those emotions, inshallah, into, you know, practical things you can do. That's one of the things in our control, inshallah, like educating ourselves and others, advocacy and help, um, donate, write letters, protest, praying and doing dhikr. I also want to share with you kind of a nuanced idea that's very important. Your kids are going to be surrounded by very diverse views out there, and so are you. You're going to have neighbors who have maybe very different views about Gaza and Israel and Palestine. Um, you're going to have people on your Facebook and social media, and, and they have very different views. Modeling to your kids, listen, this is our code of conduct as Muslims. 
And, you know, we don't respond to hate with being worse or, you know, we have a prophetic model for how to use our tongue and to use our character, right? And, you know, if, if you're having a hard time with that, reach out to people like Dr. Rania and listen to all of the great talks right now by the Shiyuch. And just remember that, you know, your kids are going to be faced with a lot of different views and reminding them all those different views. Those are from families that may have their own histories and cultures and may be hurting in their own ways. And, you know, we have some different ways of looking at it and educate yourselves as a family. So many books online about how to talk to your kids about Palestine. I don't want to go into all of them, but you can even Google this or children's books about Palestine that if your kids are bringing it up, then you can show or read these with them. So with that said, may Allah make it easy for each and every one of us because we are shepherds of our families and it's an honor and it can also be a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of energy that goes into it. So khair for being here and may Allah reward all of you.